Now, let us focus on the topic that is of our interest for today's uh, lecture which is EEG. Now, this earlier one was like a, uh, like a trailer right where you have to understand further how the ECG signals are obtained. If you uh, also have seen the earlier part, we have discussed about ECG in detail right. Uh, it is all only about EMG further. So, I, I give it to you as an exercise of how can you design uh, EMG uh, from the EMG signal, how can you design uh, a circuit that can help to move the, the muscles of a next uh, person. If I, if I connect EMG signals over here, uh, e, e, if, I, if I take the EMG signals from my muscle moment in there is a person next to me, if I do this particular moment, can he or she can also perform the same moment because of my moment of uh, uh, my, 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 my arm moment. Right. So, this is a circuit that you need to design, how can you transmit the signals to the next person's hand and how it can be connected. It is not so easy, it is a, it's a uh, detailed research problem. Uh, so, the, the best way is if you see the TED talks, you can understand how it can be uh, uh, it can be applied, okay. But but the point is, uh, you you should get into the research domain, and this is only way that you can understand that you can use the uh, uh, the basic uh, understanding of your uh, op amps and your analog uh, circuits to develop the electronic module for such applications, okay? Like signal conditioning circuits for ECG, for EMG, and now we are talking about EEG, okay? So, let me go to the uh, slide and we are talking about EEG. So, EEG stands for electroencephalogram uh, is commonly used in medical and research areas to record the biopotentials uh, and the biopotentials are occurring from they occur from brain placing electrodes on the scalp. So, what exactly EEG do? EEG reflects the electrical activity of brain that is the use of EEG. Next one, it gives high temporal resolution, some milliseconds and low spatial resolution. So, uh, uh, if you see the in 1912, uh, Valdemir which uh, recorded EEG from animal model, uh, which was a dog. Uh, and then uh, further in 1914, uh, first EEG uh, was recorded of induced seizures uh, and then Berger in 1924 recorded uh, first EEG signal from human and coined the term electroencephalogram. So, that is how the name uh, uh, came from 1924 onwards, lot of research is going on, it is an interesting field uh, for all of us to work on right because it is related to brain. And Unfortunately, we have not explored the early part of the brain. Uh, it is very difficult, it is extremely complex uh, uh, you know uh, in terms of electronics if you want to say brain is the most complex electronic circuit uh, and we have yet to identify uh, wha what exactly is the role of each and every part in the brain. When you see a brain, uh, it looks like a, it's a looks like a, it is called gray matter by the way uh, and you do not have a separate columns where it is responsible for that particular particular action. So, so, so uh, if you see the EEG, uh, it is not uh, just a, a signal coming from one single neuron, uh, it is a activity produced uh, uh, by several groups of neurons. That is what is written over here, uh, we, when we talk about EEG, single neuron activity produces two small signal to record. EEG reflects the summation of synchronous activity of many neurons with similar uh, spatial uh, orientations. It is difficult to detect signals from deep sources, for example, subcortical areas, uh, then the areas near the skull. Uh, for de uh, determining the deep sources, we had to rely on micro needles, we had to rely on the ECOG, uh, uh, and that is a different topic. We will not talk about that uh, in this particular module. I want to show it to you how the electrodes are placed uh, onto the uh, onto the uh, scalp to get the EEG signal out. Okay, that is my point of showing you this particular slide. Uh, we can see that there are ways of uh, uh, you know placing the electrodes onto the onto the head, and this is the uh, one such diagram. Uh, where you are understanding the uh, frontal portion, the central portion, the posterior portions, right, and then the temporal portions. So that's one for T, C, uh, F, and then P. Okay. So uh, 
uh, when you talk about uh, neurons right uh, then there are dendrites and there is a neuron body axon which connects to other uh, sympathetic terminals uh, and then uh, you have some uh, few millivolts of uh, uh, actually microvolts of signal that is generated uh, and this is a, a schematic uh, of the electrodes placed on the head of a of a, of a, of a, of a, of a patient um, and then uh, like I said uh, we are understanding the uh, signals that are generated from the near area of the uh, skull. Uh, this is how the uh, origin of EEG we can describe. Uh, you, if you see this particular figure, uh, there are active synapses uh, and there are afferent exons and there is a efferent exons. Uh, so, efferent exons is on the back side, efferent exons is on the front side and then there is a pia meter uh, and then there is a dura meter, skull and scalp and on the scalp we are actually placing the EEG electrode. So, if I further magnify this particular uh, uh, area, then what you will I have is the functions uh, and the potential that are uh, uh, generating from the group of neurons causes the uh, change in the signal which we are measuring through EEG electrode. And if you see the EEG pattern then you can see here and this, this is a sum EEG uh, from several neurons. Uh, this is a irregular pattern where it is a, sun, a synchronized one. So, many neurons need to sum their activity in order to be detected by EEG. Uh, the timing of the activity is crucial and the synchronized neural activity produces large signal. So, if we talk about brain waves, uh, then brain waves are commonly peak measured as peak to peak voltage as normal range from 0 0.5 to 100 micro volts. Now, if you see the uh, ECG or EMG, these the uh, voltage is really high, uh, but when you talk about EEG, we are looking at some micro volts of signal. Okay. So, which is uh, approximately 100 times lower than ECG signal. Uh, we use Fourier transform power spectrum um, uh, to uh, or, or using that uh, uh, Fourier transform power spectrum, the raw EEG signal is uh, derived uh, and then the brain state of the individual may uh, make certain frequencies more dominant while the brain waves have been categorized into four basic uh, groups. Uh, uh, so, if you see the basic groups, uh, we have beta, we have alpha, we have uh, theta and we have delta. So, uh, uh, this is the model where there is a epilepsy and then there is a beta signal, alpha signal, theta signal and delta signal. So, what are those groups? Let us see. And the first one which is beta signal is uh, a signal which is greater than 13 hertz uh, obtained at 13 hertz and is awake, non-focused, uh, relaxed, drowsy or non-vigilant, uh, the low level of environmental simulations. While the alpha signal which is between 8 to 13 hertz, we are uh, it is awake, alert, focused, attention uh, and problem solving, dream, REM, sleep, high level of environmental simulation examples, high eyes open. Uh, we, we get it uh, at 8 to 13 hertz, while the theta uh, we obtain around 4 to 8 hertz which is a visual imaginary or uh, it is a, a light sleep where we can say or uh, hypnopomic uh, uh, imagery. Uh, uh, for those kind of uh, things we can get theta signal which is between 4 to 8 hertz. Uh, while finally, if we are in deep and restful sleep uh, or vague dream states then uh, the signals are obtained around 0.5 to 4 hertz. So, if you see here, uh, if uh, this is the, these are the signals how it looks like in EEG. If you see, it's excited. You have this kind of signal, while the relaxed signals are are over here. Uh, if you are drowsy, then the signal changes. While you are asleep, the signal changes. If you're in deep sleep, the signal changes. Right? While a person, if it's he, he or she is in coma, the signals are. So, the point is that EEG signals are extremely important to understand the state of mind and uh, uh, again when you are talking about human brain waves like we have discussed the gamma is only 31 to 100, beta is 16 to 30, alpha is 8 to 15, theta is 4 to 7, delta is from 0.1 to 3 hertz and each has their own functions. Uh, I chose a particular uh, state of brain where we talk about delta then it is awareness or healing sleep, when you talk about theta it is about media meditation. Uh, uh, or intuition memory, when you talk about alpha it is more about relaxation or visualization creativity, when you talk about beta it is alertness uh, and concentration on cognition, where you talk about gamma it is about insight, peak focus, expanded uh, consciousness. So, EEG uh, potentials are not only good indicators of the global brain state, but they often display rhythmic patterns at characteristic frequencies which helps to understand the health of a brain or the state of the brain.
ok. So, I will move to the next slide and this is how the standard EEG makes use of 21 electrodes and like I said it is different uh, uh, places that has identified that we need to put the, uh, uh, the electrodes or place the electrodes. Uh, this is called a vortex right uh, and then we uh, we have 1020 system where you put something at the posterior side from the, the central zone and the frontier side um, uh, and then we have a pre uh, oracle point. Uh, we have nascent point uh, above which it is con uh, counted. So, this is, a, this is actually a, a kind of a complex phenomenon uh, and let us not uh, uh, divert ourselves into this particular uh, domain rather than we focus that if we want to measure the signals coming out of this e electrodes what kind of signal conditioning system we should develop ok. So, the first thing is um, uh, check the impedance of the electrodes. The impedance to reduce the impedance we use the uh, gel which are wet electrodes uh, and uh, now there are also new electrodes uh, that people use uh, and they are called dry electrodes. So, uh, we will see the videos of dry electrodes as well and the wet electrodes as well. Now, like I said uh, there are several uh, domain that we uh, or, or terminology we are using for example, FZ, CZ, PZ right. So, what are those things? So, we have F stands for frontal, T stands for temporal and C stands for central all right. Uh, even number that is right side of the head and odd number is on the left side of the head. So, this is the international uh, 2020 system which ensures the uh, consistency um, and this is how the signals are the signals looks like it is uh, it's, uh, not so easy to understand just by looking at the signals, uh, but if a person is suffering from epilepsy then you will see a certain change in the pattern uh, uh, well compared to a normal person. So, uh, the, there is scope of uh, uh, further op, uh, you know optimizing the signals and uh, adding the machine learning part to it to make it uh, easier for a doctor to uh, diagnose. Now, what are the advantage of measuring EEG and what are the limitations or what are the cons and pros? So, the pros are that good time resolution compared to fMRI, fMRI stands for a functional uh, uh, MRI uh, and uh, uh, it is a magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, uh, so, compared to that we have a good resolution uh, because it is a milliseconds compared to some seconds in fMRI. Then the advantage of EEG is that it is not only affordable, but also it is portable. Uh, further there is a more tolerant to subject moment at fMRI. In fMRI if you have just seen MRI, uh, person has to lay down uh, in the in this in the equipment uh, in, the, in, the, in the system and then the uh, signals are uh, generated uh, and uh, captured while in case of EEG a, a person is more free to uh, move uh, uh, compared to fMRI. Uh, EEG is silent and so useful for studying auditory processing as well while in case of fMRI it is not possible and uh, the advantage of uh, EEG is that can be combined with fMRI as well as uh, TMS or TMS. The, the disadvantages we can say or the uh, or the cons are that it is a low special uh, spe spectral resolution and artifacts are there and there is a noise ok. So, let us see uh, 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 how EEG and brain waves are uh, uh, associated. I will play video one by one and then you uh, look into that. Let us see the first video. for your ERP session, you will be greeted by Frank and Nate. You can play with Nate while your family talks with Frank and reads about the study. It was great to see that Charlie was comfortable playing so that I was able to talk to Frank and read about the study. While you play, Nate will show you the caps that you will wear during the study. They are stretchy and have lots of little holes in them. He will show you the syringe that he will use to help him get the cap ready. It looks like something that you might get a shot with, but it's not sharp at all and it won't hurt you. It's only used to put some sticky gel into the holes in the cap. You'll be able to put a cap on yourself and play with the syringe. That way you will know exactly what will happen when Nate puts the cap on you. Nate let him touch the syringe so he would know that it wasn't sharp or scary. It also helped prepare him for seeing it again later when it was his turn. When playtime is done, you'll sit in a big white chair and pick out some cartoons you'd like to watch. You'll get to watch the first cartoon while Nate gets you ready for your cap. First, he'll have to clean around your eyes and behind your ears with a wet cloth. Nate 
Next, he'll brush your hair and measure your head to be sure exactly which cap will fit you best. It was nice to get to sit right there with him so that I could see what was going on and be there if he needed anything. Before he puts the cap on your head, he'll put a few wires on your face with some stickers. When he's done with the stickers, he'll put the cap on your head. While they were putting the cap on, they explained the different steps so that nothing came as a surprise. Then, using the syringe he showed you during playtime, he'll put some cold gel in each one of the holes in the cap. After there's gel in all of the holes, you'll go into the little room to watch a video that you selected earlier. You can ask your mom or dad to come with you into the little room if you'd like. I got to go into the sound booth with him, which helped him feel relaxed. I thought it would be hard to help him stay still, but the room was calm and quiet, and we just sat and watched the cartoons. Inside the study chamber, it's dark and quiet, and you'll get to watch another cartoon. While you're watching this cartoon, it's important to be very still and very quiet. After you're done watching the cartoon, the cap and stickers will be taken off. They took the cap and stickers off and told him what a great job he did. When that's done, you'll get to play and have fun in the lab spaceship. Charlie thought all the equipment was cool, but I think his favorite part was getting to climb into the spaceship at the end. Thanks to their patience and care in explaining the process, it was a great experience. Now, let us see the second video. Backyard Brains presents the electroencephalogram, also known as the EEG. Observe the alpha waves of the visual cortex of the human brain. For this experiment, you need a heart and brain spiker shield, an Arduino, a computer, and yourself. To begin, take the Backyard Brain's custom EEG headband and place it on your forehead such that the electrodes on the back of the headband are located on the back of your head. For the ground, we will place an adhesive electrode on the mastoid process, which is the bony projection you can feel behind your ear. To improve the interface, we will place some conductive gel in between the electrode and the skin. If you have long hair, you can part the hair directly underneath each electrode to further improve the quality of the signal. With your orange interface cable, attach the red alligator clips to the electrodes on the back of the head, which is which does not matter, and the black alligator clip to the ground behind the ear. We then plug the orange cable into the orange port on the heart and brain spiker shield and the USB cable on the other side. The other end of the USB cable goes into the computer, and we are ready to begin. But what is going on here? When your eyes are open, the visual cortex in your brain is processing a lot of information about your entire visual field, about levels of contrast, color, and light. But when your eyes are closed, the field is dark, and hence, counterintuitively, the neurons in your visual cortex become more synchronized. 
A popular analogy is to imagine yourself outside a stadium during halftime. There are a lot of conversations occurring inside the stadium, a lot of information processing. But outside the stadium, all you hear is a dim hum of noise. This is equivalent to the eyes open condition in the electroencephalogram. Alternatively, during the singing of the national anthem, many of the spectators inside the stadium are singing the same thing. They are synchronized. And this signal is strong enough that you can plainly hear it, though distorted, outside of the stadium. This is equivalent to the eyes closed condition of the electroencephalogram. The physiological underpinnings of the EEG signal are complex and still a topic of active investigation in the neuroscience community, but we currently understand it to be the summed activity of many synapses in the upper layers of the cerebral cortex. Our heart and brain shield thus amplifies the electrical activity of the synapses such that we can view them on a computer under the appropriate conditions. Click on the settings button in our spike recorder software and select connect via USB port. Within a couple seconds, you should see the signal change to a putative EEG signal. You can zoom out of the time scale by using the two finger motion on your trackpad or the scroll wheel on your mouse and zoom in on the Y axis by clicking on the positive button on the left side of the screen. But how do we know this EEG signal is real? Well, let's close our eyes. Those ripples are the 8 to 10 hertz alpha waves of the visual cortex that disappear when the eyes open again. If you click on the FFT button, you will bring up a spectrogram view, which will show the EEG signal decomposed into frequency, time, and amplitude. Thus, when the eyes are closed, you will note the increased signal strength at 8 to 10 hertz. Under appropriate conditions, the alpha waves of the visual cortex are readily apparent, whether you're showing them to your friends on a Friday night in your living room or in front of 200 people for your high school or college lecture course. These alpha waves were first discovered by Hans Berger, a German physiologist in the 1920s, and subsequently verified by Lord Edgar Adrian at the University of Cambridge in the 1930s. We thank our many friends at the Santiago Makerspace in Chile who worked with us to replicate these findings in a compelling and simple way. We also thank our production team, and this is just the beginning as we further our explorations into the EEG signal. What will you discover? Backyard Brains, neuroscience for everyone. And uh, let me play the third video as well and then we will discuss. So we're going to be recording your EEG today. And so essentially what we're going to do is put this swim cap over the top of your head. This it doesn't have any feeling associated with it or any encumbers. It's just a pretty easy process. Okay. Put these little spon these uh, foam sponges on these here. And now the cap will go over your head. Okay. okay. This is the hardest part of the whole process. Is right here. This cap goes right over the top of your head, just above your eyes. So. Two ear sensors here, one on each side. Okay. On the other side over here. So the hard part's over. So now from here, all we do is I have this syringe. It looks like a needle, but it's not a needle. Just so you can see, it's not sharp or anything here. And so what I do is I take this and I put the paste into each of these sensors. Here. So that, the one in each of these holes, so that we can get a good connection between the sensors and your scalp. So there shouldn't be any pain involved or anything like that. It's just a connection between your sensors and your scalp. So that's all there is to it. And so what you'll do now is just sit here for 10 minutes with your eyes closed. You'll look forward, sit nice and still, relax your shoulders, your jaw, your forehead, all of that. And I'm gonna be behind you here recording the EEG. We'll do that for 10 minutes with your eyes closed. Then we do 10 minutes with your eyes open, and then we're done. That's all there is to it. Okay. 
So, what you have seen is uh, three videos right which uh, uh, shows how the EEG and the brain waves are related. Now, let us first understand the potential applications of EEG before we go to the next slide and uh, the most important part uh, or applications of EEG are that it require it monitors alertness, coma, brain death, locates area of damage following head injury, stroke or tumor. Uh, it is uh, uh, used as test afferent pathways uh, by evoke potentials. Uh, we will talk about evoke potentials uh, and uh, uh, other uh, signals generating from the brain in the in the next uh, module, uh, where one of my student will uh, discuss uh, the experimental part of uh, uh, of uh, or the application of EEG uh, for a research domain. Uh, we can also monitor cognitive engagement which is alpha rhythm, it can be help for producing the biofeedback situations, uh, it can control the anesthesia depth uh, which is also called servo anesthesia, uh, it can be used for investigating epilepsy and locating seizure, uh, seizure. Uh, it can be uh, under to understand the uh, efficacy of drug uh, which is anti epileptic drugs, uh, it can be used in assisting in experimental or cortical existence or epileptic focus, it can be used for monitoring human and brain animal brain activities and development. Uh, uh, it can be also used for testing drugs for convulsive effects and investigate sleep disorder as well as uh, physiology or end physiology. So, the applications of EEG as you can see are enormous. Now, let us understand uh, how we can uh, have a laboratory testing of electrophysiology. Uh, so, EEG measurement system consists of the following first is uh, electrodes. So, the electrodes are either dry or wet I will uh, like I said the, uh, the next module we will show it to you how the dry electrode looks like. Uh, the wet electrodes we have to use a gel to uh, reduce the impedance um, in dry electrode that is not a problem. Uh, then we have uh, amplifiers with filters uh, where we have signal conditioning circuit to amplify signal and remove the artifacts. Then we have a digital oscilloscope. Now, why we have digital oscilloscope uh, for analyzing the signal and uh, this is again laboratory testing. So, we will have this kind of uh, equipment. Uh, recording, recording electrodes. So, when you talk about recording electrodes, uh, first is for acquiring or recording the high quality EEG signals, there exist different types of electrodes. The following are the different type of electrodes for testing. First is disposable uh, gel less and pre gel types of uh, electrode. Uh, then second one is uh, reusable disc electrodes which are made up of gold, silver, stainless steel or tin. Uh, next one is headbands and electrode gap caps. Uh, finally, we have saline based electrodes and needle electrodes. Okay. The, the most common scalp electrodes are AGAGCL uh, disc of 1 to 3 millimeter in diameter whereas, the needle electrodes are used for long recordings and are invasively inserted. So, AG, AGCL is where uh, people are using, but people are moving towards dry electrodes uh, because of the difficulty of uh, holding these wet electrodes with uh, gel. Uh, so, what kind of amplifiers and filters we require? The signal conditioning uh, are required in order to, circuits are required in order to amplify and make compatible with according devices such as displays, records, or ADCs. Uh, however, the acquired signal uh, are extremely small and low of low magnitude and that is why it contains artifacts. So, what kind of filters we have to use right. So, if you see the slide thus we, it is required to amplify and remove the unwanted noise because it is of very low magnitude right and to improve the signal to noise ratio. So, SNR ratio uh, we need to uh, improve and that is why the, the basic requirements that a bad potential amplifier should satisfy uh, those are uh, that the measure signal should not be distorted. Uh, the amplifier should provide the best possible separation in say of signal and interferences. Uh, the amplifier has to pro offer protection of the patient from hazard of electric shock and then the amplifier itself has to be protected against the damages that might result from high input voltages as they occur during the application of defibrillators or electrosurgical. Uh, instrumentations. Uh, also very important part is that physiological process to be monitored should not be influenced in any way by the amplifier. So, a lot of things uh, uh, rely on the instrumentation part and that is why the designing of the signal conditioning component is extremely important. So, that is why when we design an amplifier what are the features that amplifier should have. The first feature the amplifier should have is uh, the differential amplification with driven shield inputs which makes it workable even in 
electrically unshielded environments. Uh, so, uh, we should have high signal to noise ratio. Second thing is it should have high input impedance and low bias current to allow recordings of small signal. Uh, then we need a dual fixed uh, frequency band pass and independent gain controllers uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 107,000 uh, uh, to allow the recording of different signals from the same uh, source with the range allowed by the next stage. Uh, finally, we should have moderate common mode rejection ratio which is the ratio of gain of differential amplifier mode over the gain of common mode. So, these are few of the features amplifier should have. Uh, uh, to take care of the artifacts and filtering the signal distortion due to artifacts contaminates the ordinary EEG signal. We know that because the EEG signals are of micro volts uh, and results in change in the sequence either with higher amplitude or by changing the signal shape. We uh, The cause of artifacts in the recorded EEG signal is due to the uh, either due to the patient related or due to the technical things. So, what are the uh, patient related artifacts and what are the technical related artifacts? Artifacts is a disturbance, it is a noise. Okay. So, patient related artifacts are when, when there is a body movements, then there is a EMG, there is a ECG, there is a pulse or pacemaker, there is a eye moment, there are uh, and there is a sitting uh, posture moment. So, this all can create artifacts in the patient related uh, 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 point, where technical related artifacts includes 50, 60 hertz power line interference that is first thing. Second thing is impedance fluctuation, third thing is cable moment and fourth thing is broken wire context. These are the four things that uh, are technical related artifacts. Uh, However, AC power line noise can be decreased by decreasing electrode impedance and by short electrode wire. So, we can reduce this uh, uh, power line noise uh, either by reducing the electrode impedance and that is how the gel is uh, comes into play or if, if you use dry electrode then the impedance also will be less uh, and we can reduce the uh, wires. Right? So, that is another way of taking care of the noise. Uh, further when you talk about this, so this is about the uh, artifice filtering. So, what are the filtering requirements? We require a high pass filter uh, uh, for reducing low frequencies coming from a bioelectric flow potentials. For example, breathing, uh, its cutoff frequency usually lies in the range of 0.1 to 0.7 hertz while to ensure that the signal is band limited a low pass filter with the cutoff frequency equal to highest frequency of our interest is used which is generally from 40 hertz up to less than one half of the sampling rate. So, these are the filtering requirements. So, if you see the circuit this is our single stage um, uh, EEG uh, you know uh, measuring circuit uh, or signal conditioning circuit looks like. Uh, it consists of uh, in input initial stage uh, where it is nothing but the instrumentation amplifier uh, uh, because it has a high signal to ratio very high impedance uh, uh, as you know the advantage of the instrumentation amplifier. Uh, then we have a broadband amplification stage stage followed by a gain controller and finally by a uh, band pass filter amplification. So, this is how the uh, you need to design a circuit. We will discuss uh, this circuit uh, in a part of the uh, experimental uh, protocol where we will show it to you uh, on a simulation how this thing, how the circuit can be designed. Um, so, if I talk about just the first stage of the um, um, of this particular signal conditioning circuit then it uses INA116. So, this is INA116 this is the input stage right these are the electrodes uh, of the EEG. Um, so, uh, because it is critical stage and the overall performance of the amplifier generated by this stage, the feature of this IC is shielded inputs. Uh, the influence of shield is that it can the, the capacitance between the electrode and the shield which is also considered as noise uh, can be cancelled with the connection of the input coaxial cable through the buffered guard drive pins. That is the advantage of using INA116 uh, thus preventing this uh, electrostatic interference with the capacitance coupling between them. Additionally, its exceptionally high input impedance and low input bias current makes it a suitable uh, component to record signals of small amplitude. We know that the EEG signals are of few micro volts and that is why it is very important to select the uh, input stage and that is why the importance of INA116. Six. However, it has only limited slew rate which is about 0.8 volts per microsecond. Therefore, if the gain is too high the output may be distorted for fast changing input. The gain of the stage is limited to 19.5 thus we cannot have extremely high gain. While if I talk about the second and third stage we see that the next stage is a band pass filtering if I go back you see this is a band pass filter 
right. So, what is the role of band pass filter? The role of band pass filter is um, that it uses two pole filter with a gain of 193.4, uh, hence it can filter the noise signal with amplification. Also, its output recovers faster with amplifier is saturated by sudden changes in DC offset at the input that is advantage of the filter circuit. Right, and the upper and lower cutoff frequency can be independently changed without affecting the gain by replacing the capacitors. You see the upper and lower frequency we can change it right uh, by replacing the capacitors and so it is not really uh, difficult. Uh, the next stage is a gain controller and in this stage a capacitor is used to cut off the DC offset voltage from previous stage. Let us see, see this is a gain controller right and here we have a capacitor to cut off the uh, DC offset. Uh, Finally, uh, the switch is connected across the fixed resistor for further attenuation to the next stage. So, if you want to use this particular circuit, then we can use the switch to have attenuation further if required. Okay. So, uh, that is the advantage of our gain controller and if I go to the last one, then what I find is that the final stage is a band pass filter with amplification. So, why it, is a, uh, why it is important because it allows not only to separate input signals uh, of two different frequency range signals, but also high frequency signals with an amplification. So, that is the advantage of your final, final band pass filter. Again like I said we will discuss this thing in the experimental part. So, if I uh, leave it to you with two videos, uh, uh, then you will understand more about what are the dry electrodes and how the signals in EEG uh, using the dry electrodes can be captured. All right. So, let me just play the first video. Quantum Applied Science and Research or Quasar is a world leader in non-invasive biosensing technology. Over a decade of research has culminated in Quasar's patented ultra-high impedance sensor technology. This dry EEG sensor forms the basis of the DSi-1020. This headset is designed to reproducibly position 21 sensors according to the 1020 international system. The headset is easy to use and can be put on by the user in less than 5 minutes without skin preparation or the use of gels. EEG data quality has signal fidelity comparable to that obtained with conventional wet electrode systems and is designed to operate in a laboratory or office environment. Here we see signals due to blinking, jaw clenches, and EEG alpha activity, all acquired in real time by QStream, the data acquisition software designed for use with the DSi-1020. Quasar has also developed sophisticated gauges for cognitive state classification. These can be tailored for specific research and monitoring applications and are implemented in real time. The DSi-1020 is a fully ambulatory system with wireless transmission capability and onboard memory storage. Unencumbered by wires, the wearer can move freely and patented technologies reduce environmental and motion artifacts. We always welcome new innovative scientific collaborations. Please contact us to discuss your applications or to arrange for collaboration where we can help you meet your research needs. Uh, so, you have seen how the dry electrode looks like and which is the company that makes it. We need to import the dry, dry electrodes for understanding the EEG signals. Uh, uh, in the experiment part, we will show it to you how the dry electrode looks like. Uh, let me play the second video which shows about how the EEG signals are captured. So, let me play that video. So, you may have seen there is a few devices become available on the market which claim to measure your brain waves or your EEG and use that to control games or to fly a helicopter or there is even a, devi a device which is my particular favourite which is called the Neko Mimi which is a pair of cat ears and it claims to use your brain power to measure your emotions and uh, shows whether you are happy or whether you are sad and if you are talking to a person whether you like them or if you hate them. So, it is kind of showing the world what you are thinking. So, these devices are all quite interesting, quite exciting, but as we have seen in uh, previous videos, it is actually quite difficult to measure a clean EEG signal without also measuring artifacts such as your eye blinks, um, just your movements generally, or even like your muscle activity in your face all affects the signal. 
So as you can't see what these devices are actually measuring as a raw signal and all you can see is the output, so the ears moving or the actual game, we're interested to see what they're actually measuring because we found it difficult to do this before. So as an example, we're using the MindFlex device today. And this is what the MindFlex looks like. And it just has a simple dry electrode, which goes on your forehead. And then it has um, a ground electrode, which goes to your ear. And then your negative electrode goes to your other ear. And um, the internal circuit that powers, well, controls the device, controls the game, uh, is this and it just takes the signals from these electrodes and it does a Fourier transform on them and so you just get the different frequency bands and it uses that to control the game. So we've removed this and we're just interested to see what's actually being measured just by these electrodes. So we've just taken a cable out. Okay, and I'll put this on. There we go. And then you may, may remember, uh, remember our bioamplifier from our previous videos, so we'll be using that again today. And we're just going to connect the ground to the middle, and then our positive electrode, and our negative. And I'll just put this on my arm. Now, you may remember in previous videos when we've been measuring EEG, we've used a gel electrode. So this is our gel electrode here that we would typically use to measure biosignals. And we'd usually uh, clean the area where we connect the electrode and abrade the skin to remove dead skin cells, oil that's on the skin or makeup or anything else. And that gives a better connection and uh, lowers the skin impedance and allows us to record a cleaner signal. And what's interesting about most of these devices that are available on the market is they just use a dry electrode and they don't recommend for you to clean the skin or anything. So it'd be interesting to see what we're going to record today. So let's have a look at our signal and that's clearly 50 hertz noise we're just seeing at the minute so we can remove that with our notch filter and see what's underneath. Now there's definitely a signal. We can look at the Fourier transform of that to see what frequencies we're measuring and now we can see if we can measure any artifacts so we'll try eye blinks and that's definitely having an effect on the signal but it's still very noisy. There may be some EEG in there, but just using the dry electrode, we're not getting a good enough contact with the skin. So what we can do is we can leave this for 10 minutes and see if we can get a cleaner signal after, we, after we've got a better connection. Okay, so it's been about 10, 15 minutes, and now we can have a look at our signal and see if it's clearer. Okay, and um, so, we definitely um, reduced the amplitude of our signal after 10-15 um, minutes um, and what we could be seeing now is EEG but we could also be seeing other artifacts as well. So we can demonstrate these to you just by um, me blinking my eyes. So you can clearly see um, the jump in the signal is to do with my eye movements and that's because the electrode's right beside my eyes. And then if I do some facial expressions, so I'm really happy, I'm using the Neko Mimi, yay, yay, so excited. <laughs> uh, and that's uh, EMG coming through, so that's me moving different muscles in my face. And just even me talking right now is uh, creating artifacts just by me again moving my facial muscles. And there's also movement artifacts in there, so if I move my head. So it's something that I could be doing while I play the game because there's, there's nothing in the instructions that say you're to remain completely still, but you can clearly see that this is all affecting the signal. So looking at our um, frequency sp uh, spectrum we're getting there from the Fourier transform, we're definitely um, getting uh, frequencies um, in the EEG band, so that's good. That means there is EEG in there, but as we've just demonstrated, there's so many other artifacts going on, it's difficult to see how these devices are just measuring the EEG and using that to control the device. It's completely up to you whether you believe these devices are working the way they say they are, but it does seem quite obvious that it's, it's very difficult to 
just measure your brain waves or your EEG without measuring other artifacts as well. And this is all going to have an effect on the output of these devices. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of filters all these devices are using, and uh, they may claim that they remove different artifacts by doing different things. But um, the, the EMG spectrum is, is within the EEG spectrum, so it would be impossible to completely remove uh, the EMG while still leaving the EEG. So uh, it's probably unlikely that they're doing that. So we've created a YouTube playlist, so you can have a look at lots of the different devices that are available commercially, and also different applications of the same kind of um, HID device. Uh, different electrodes and you can make up your own mind what you think um, these videos are showing or what you think the device is measuring. Okay, so you have seen this uh, video as well. So uh, just to uh, summarize the entire uh, uh, you know uh, uh, lecture uh, in in one um, in one or two sentences, uh, what I will like you guys to do is you understand what kind of electronics conditioning circuits you can design for ECG as well for EMG as well. That will be kind of uh, homework uh, where I have to trust you that you are doing homework, right? Uh, of course, we will give you a lot of uh, assignments and uh, there are a lot of tests that you need to appear for, uh, but uh, as a part of uh, uh, you know understanding the signal conditioning circuit further, if you can understand how can you design an electron conditioning circuit for ECG and how can design for EMG, then you can understand the, the ease or difficulty that you have when you are designing for EEG, EEG being the lowest or uh, in amplitude is few micro volts compared to those uh, uh, signals that you obtain from the heart or from the muscles, right. So, uh, you, you just think about this again uh, look at this particular uh, class and focus on the next one where I have uh, discussed with my TAs of, of how to show it to you uh, the uh, uh, performance of this EEG circuit and uh, we will also show it to you how understanding EEG can help you to solve a particular problem particularly when you are talking about uh, the deafness. Okay, deafness in units. So, that is what our interest is that how can you understand using the EEG signal whether a newborn baby can hear or not. All right. So, that we will discuss in the experimental part till then you take care if you have any questions uh, feel free to ask us through forum and I will see you in the next class.